Hey there gamers, I'm Jim and this is Pruitt. And make no illusion, without exclusion, this WebDM collusion will start with the School of Illusions. Jim, illusions. What are illusions other than tricks? So the player's handbook gives us a very scattered and unfocused definition of illusions. And what I found while researching for these shows is that the definitions of the spell schools in D&D have no internal consistency and very little fidelity between the actual spells that are on the list yeah. and what, what the spell school definition is. There are spells in almost every spell school that it's like, why is this here and not, not in another oh, one? Right, right, right. And we're not even going to talk about why healing isn't on the necromancy spell list, but th this isn't a show about necromancy. No, we'll, anyway, get, we'll get to that. <laughs> we will get to that. We'll raise it at a later date. Right, we'll raise that subject later. Right now we're talking about illusions, and the, the player's handbook defines illusions as, as spells which deceive the senses or the mind, manipulate the senses in some way, create phantom images, or as the, as the player's handbook sort of cautions that the most insidious of the illusion spells affect the target's mind directly, causing them to see something. So we can already see that in, uh, illusion and enchantment have a strong overlap yes. here, and there are going to be spells where it feels like, is, shouldn't this be... A, 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 a enchantment yeah. and not necessarily illusion. Yeah, if you're tricking the brain. Right. That how is that not a, a type of enchantment? And I, you know, at the same time, I like that the that the lines between the spell schools are a little fuzzy, mm -hmm. because I I don't like the very predictable, logical, rational magic that Dungeons and Dragons has. I like the fancy and spell casting, and I like some of the spells and the way you can use them in adventures. But just overall, D and D magic doesn't feel very magical to me. It, it feels like more of a, a system of powers that fits within a rational scheme, as opposed to like the mystical force of the universe that's hard to understand and doesn't quite make a ton of sense. Right. So in terms of illusion spells themselves, um, you know, spells that deceive the senses or the mind, let's think, talking like disguise self, mm -hmm. um, invisibility, hypnotic pattern, spells like that, right? Also, you know, you got your mirror image, uh, yeah. more of a defensive minded uh, spell. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to deception of the mind, it begs the question, like, are these like, Holograms? Are they mental projections in the mind? It's something to, to, to think about. Because it is one, to think one about, leans yeah. more enchantment, one leans more like, okay, well, I can see that as an illusion. You can see that as an illusion. You can even see it as an evocation, right? Evocation brings things into existence that did not otherwise exist. And why wouldn't light be one of those things that's being brought into existence? So even to me, like, thinking of illusion is like, okay, it's purely the manipulation of light to create these different effects, whether it's like, creating a shell of transparency or reflectiveness to create an invisible creature or do it manipulating light in some way to create an image that anyone can see but then at the same time i like I said that there's sort of blurred lines i think between even illusion and evocation in that mm -hmm. respect in terms of the what you're talking about the images that illusion creates are they something that anyone can see it, it like it's a hologram that that exists outside of the senses of the perceiver or is it just a uh, a hallucination projected into the mind of mm -hmm. the of the of the target of the spell? And I think it's it's interesting to see, right? Like the spells that create an image, silent image, major image, even something like mirror image, any of those that have a thing that exists externally to the senses. It, to me, it's sort of like, all right, how does that interact with? creatures that don't have a visual sense. A lot of this is just common sense. If a, a creature has no sight uh, and only perceives through blind sense or something, then they might be completely immune to these sorts of spells which create an image of some kind. And then similarly with like a mental image or a hallucination, those are spells like Phantasmal Force, Phantasmal Killer, Weird is, mm -hmm. a, is another one, uh, even though it's not really worth a ninth level spell slot. Uh, but they are ones that project something in directly into the mind you can like Professor X someone, yeah. right? Make them see something that's not there or perceive something that isn't and then eventually like harm themselves through the use of this spell because they're sort of like scared or something like that. I think the hallucinations are more interesting in terms of like their story potential, the, the, the impact that they have on the game world than like a projected image. But it's worth thinking about the difference between the two of them and, mm -hmm. and, and how a dungeon master would uh, adjudicate rules based on, you know, like, okay, I'm gonna project an image of a monster into someone's, directly into someone's mind using Phantasmal Force, 
versus like I'm going to conjure an image of a monster using major image. What impact does that have on mm -hmm. uh, how the dungeon master reacts? And I think it comes down to the kind of uh, the the die rolling that affects those two spells that uh, affect the mind require a save. Spells that create an image require a skill check to to come along and investigate and sort of see what's going on. And that's kind of the clue as to the, the power and potential of these uh, these particular types of spells. When thinking about that, mm -hmm. um, how do different senses like alter the perception of, say, like silent image or major image, things uh -huh. like that? Like, how would a DM think about like wild animals that don't right. have investigation uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. but you're trying to like dupe a bear or something like to get by it. <laughs> this is one of the areas where dungeon masters and players see a lot of friction over the use of illusion. Yeah. Is how monsters and NPCs and, and the, the, the creatures under the DM's control react to the presence of illusions. If you go online and you look at sort of like players who are who are trying to play illusionists, the first thing people will tell them is check with your dungeon master first. They're one of the more, um, you know, DM dependent archetypes out there. I mean, summoners and other kinds of uh, character archetypes, they're gonna have a lot of minions and the like or another one you'd wanna talk to your DM with. But illusionists and casters who are gonna really use illusions owe it to themselves to talk to their DM because if you have an unimaginative DM Mm -hmm. who takes rules literally and doesn't try to work through the implications of something, isn't willing to go beyond the text of a spell to see how it might impact things, you know, and, and takes that text as exhaustive instead of just a jumping off point. If you have a dungeon master like that, then playing an illusionist is probably going to be an exercise in frustration as you're attempting to create images and, and uh, you know, illusions of things that you want the world to react to in a certain way, where the dungeon master says, well, I don't have to, you know, the, my, the bear is, not, is gonna ignore the image of the wolf that you've conjured, or, or vice versa, or something like that. Or, you know, these, these guards are engaged in mortal combat with the party, they don't care that an image of allies arriving uh, it comes up. You know, if you don't have DMs that use morale rules, if you don't have DMs that use reaction roles for the kinds of uh, monsters that they have, if you don't have a dungeon master who, um, you know, has their enemies run away because because they have every fight ever is a fight to the death, even if it doesn't make a lick of sense, then yeah. you're going to have difficulty. Uh, you're going to have difficulty there because you might want to say scare off someone with an illusion, and the dungeon master's not going to let you, or you're going to want to, you know, have an illusion shake the confidence of someone and give you an advantage in a situation, and the dungeon master's going to be like, no, I'm not going to do that. Talk to the DM first sit down with them, th throw out some scenarios of how you think you'd like to use these spells, engage their reaction, and then if it's a reaction that seems like it's a lot of no, 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 that's not how the spell works, that's not how this works, that's not, that's, you know, I wouldn't do it that way, then it sucks, but you might have to play a different kind of character. Uh, <laughs> well, that's sort yeah. of like player advice in that scenario, right? <laughs> yeah, but, but, but I mean, like, when you have, like, say, what, uh, like, major images, what, like, 15 foot? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Square. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, down a narrow alley, if you had like what looked like nine allies <laughs> running up on you right. and the DM failed their investigation check, I mean, shouldn't they like look at that and be like, fuck? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, even if they interacted with it in the first place to, to yeah. trigger the investigation check. To me, this is how I've always run them is I've, I've looked and seen like what kind of effect is the player going for with this illusion? Mm -hmm. and, and, and asking the player directly, what do, you, what do you want the outcome to be? What is the intent of summoning this image or creating this illusion? You know, what's the point of it? Are you trying to scare someone off? Are you trying to intimidate them? Almost always it's about that. It's about stopping a fight before it can start. Mm -hmm. And particularly when times when I've played an illusionist or had other illusionists in the party with me, there's, uh, or, or a DMing illusionist, mm -hmm. there's a tendency to want to use the illusions in a clever way before the fight begins, as opposed to like during the fight to try to trick enemies or something. But that can happen as well, right? I've seen people use illusions to create the impression of there being like barriers of some kind that would prevent um, you know, the, the, their enemies from following them or attacking them or going a certain way. Um, but for dungeon masters, 
I once I've kind of determined whether or not the, you know what the effect that the player wants is, then it's a matter of seeing like how is my party or how are my uh, NPCs and, and whoever's with them going to react. Mm -hmm. How's this monster going to react? So use some examples. You know, you're trying to scare off an animal. If there's no scent component to the the illusion, you know, then it, I'm probably going to have that animal react in a way that's sort of like. Maybe they're a little scared. Maybe they don't know what's going on. But it's not like uh, you know, if you cast, a, if you create an illusion of the scent of a bear, then maybe wolves are going to leave you alone. And I think like the scent of something for animals is maybe more important than the sound or the visual mm -hmm. of it, uh, particularly if they have something like keen senses, mm -hmm. uh, the like. Right. But I would I would think of that as something along the lines of yes, they have a stronger sense of smell, mm -hmm. so that gives them advantage on the perception check. Mm -hmm. But if they still fail a perception check, say versus the, versus the investigation DC, mm -hmm. then they just don't like they pay more attention to what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Like say a major image that has sight and sound, mm -hmm. they're paying more attention to what they're seeing and hearing yeah. than the smell. Yeah, I can see that. Right. I can see that. Having, and having and so I think involved. they're actually like not like using the tools best suited to them. Right. But that's because your illusion is so real mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's tr a big bear trundling at a wolf or wolves coming after a bear or something yeah. like I don't know. I mean, there are multiple ways to interact with an illusion. Mm -hmm. To remember all the senses is is important. It is important, and I, I think like trying to to figure out kind of like how how your enemies react. This is why having a reaction table can be helpful, because it's something you can roll on. You can have modifiers for whatever you know. If they're if these are like the elite guards, then their reactions are going to tend more towards staying in the fight and confronting who they perceive as as enemies mm -hmm. as opposed to maybe just like scrub guards who the minute things get difficult are going to run away and and you know complain to the boss oh, right right yeah. <laughs> that's the rules that's i need mean, to go rules, get a manager right? i'll be right back yeah <laughs> they're just you know they're there to keep an eye on things keep the riffraff out having something that provides you with a framework for how enemies will react to unseen or unexpected threats can be helpful. Mm -hmm. If your illusionist conjures an image of a spell effect, right? Like that's what I've used a lot of times as an illusionist is like, I'm gonna conjure a sphere of annihilation or a prismatic wall right. to make the people seem like I am a more powerful caster than I actually am. I wouldn't do this for casters, right? They'll see right through this shit. But for guards and the like, for people who have no idea what magic is, Here's my sphere of annihilation, you guys. I'm you get, gonna, yeah. <laughs> if you get a, near me, if you I'm get gonna melt me, your face. <laughs> you're gonna melt your face, and maybe you have like a secondary illusion going on of like uh, it, it hitting something and it disintegrating a portion of it <laughs> that the guards then react to. Mm -hmm. That's many, creating spell effects, bringing in illusions that look like monsters or bigger creatures or bigger animals or something like that. These are all scenarios where the dungeon master, you're gonna have to figure out how your opponents and how the pieces you control react. And it's worthwhile to do that because you've got a player that's playing a, a caster with that uses a lot of illusions and they want that kind of interaction between the game world and their illusions and they want it to be more than just like, oh, everyone knows this is an illusion? Like, yeah. really? It's gonna get, you know, I can't ever, you know, come up with something that's going to work. Uh, I, I think Pruitt's suggestion of having some kind of role is probably the better way to do it, if only because I've seen a lot of arguments between players and Dungeon Masters where it comes down to things like, well, I think they should react like this. And the Dungeon Master goes, well, I kind of think they're going to react like this. And of course, both sides want the best outcome for them. Mm -hmm. And so even having something like, yeah, there's a, a, a role in there somewhere to help determine when you know, when and where these uh, disputes, how they're resolved, uh, can be helpful. Uh, so yeah, that's that's sort of like a just general advice for managing illusions at the table as a dungeon master is, you know, how, how do they react? How does your world react to these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I love the idea of, of, of recreating other spell effects with illusions because yeah. if there is a class to do that, Right. You know, if you, you know, people are running up on you and you <laughs> throw a fireball up in the air and then point the wand at him and go, the next one's for you. Right. You know? Yeah. Like, uh -huh. maybe, maybe that'll work. Maybe that'll work. I, I, there have been times when I've allowed what I call pseudo damage to be, uh, for illusions to do pseudo damage. In fifth edition, I would characterize that as psychic damage that goes away pretty much immediately. It's a, it's a temporary kind of thing and it will not kill you. At best, it will knock you out temporarily. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so pseudo damage is like, you know, I conjure a, a major image of a gout of flame that's, you know, spraying across the whatever. And it's, it's not real, you know, that they're, it's not really going to harm them, but those guards might react in such a way that they take pseudo damage. And, you know, if that temporarily knocks them out, uh, then that's mm -hmm. one thing, but it might only last as long as that ma illusion's maintained. Yeah, yeah. And then once it's gone, then the, the pseudo damage is, is gone. Right. It's itself. Uh, and so there, there are times when I do something like that, uh, particularly if it's like a mental illusion, mm -hmm. um, where, where it's, you know, directly in their mind and not like a physical thing they can interact with. I just got the image of like a bunch of guards falling over like fainting goats, just like <laughs> you're right. coming out of the... <laughs> just like falling over. Yeah. Like, turn, illusionist turns around. Works every time. Works every time as they get themselves up and, and the illusionist runs away from whatever it was that they're yeah. doing. Yeah, Phantasmal Force is a fun spell for doing this. It's not the best spell. There are better spells to cast. There are, you know, there's even better illusion spells to cast. But if you want an illusion that's going to do actual damage, yeah. Phantasmal Force is kind of it. There's Phantasmal Killer, but I'll be mm -hmm. perfectly honest, that requires two saves and is really weak. And Weird, which is just mass Phantasmal Killer, yeah. is suffers from the same problems that yeah. Phantasmal Killer does and the fact that it's not Wish. Uh, there's, also, there's also Shadow Blade. You, you're conjuring a shadow weapon as opposed to creating an illusion of some crazy right. who knows what. Yeah, um, I, I, this, is, this is one of those areas where I find like the inclusion of the Shadow Fell and, and Shadow Magic under the umbrella of illusion to be an, a poor fit. Because mm -hmm. I, I would rather, personally I would rather... It's kind of like conjuration a bit. A it's little right, bit. You're, you're pulling things from other planes yeah. and, and drawing things out. Creation is the same way. We'll get to oddballs uh, later yeah. on in the episode, but anything which like pulls something from another plane and creates something out of it to me is conjuration mm -hmm. because the shadow fell has the theme of deception and, and, and the night and shadows and hiding and sort of this illusion. I think the ma thematically shadow magic and illusion get coupled together. Yeah. Um, but I see shadow magic as just as viable as under necromancy as well as conjuration. Right, like there's a, there's thematic elements that connect it to to necromancy. So, but phantasmal force is is if you want to create a mental image in someone's mind of anything that does damage, phantasmal force is it. And if I were running a game for an illusionist or or someone who's going to be casting a lot of phantasmal forces, then I would consider beefing up the spell, at the very least, letting it do more damage if you upcast it from a higher level slot. And probably bringing the damage it does more in line with single target second uh, second level spells like say Scorching Ray, even mm -hmm. though Scorching Ray can target multiples, but something like that. If yeah. only because a D6 of psychic damage is just kind of for a second level spell. You know, I'm I'm saying at least three D6. Come on. I don't think that's gonna break the game. I don't I mean, think it's gonna break you're the still, game. You're still they still no. have a save to to avoid it, and no. it's only one character. To me, the, the big problem with Phantasmal Killer is it requires two saves. I, I don't think it should require two saves. I think it should just be one and done, and, mm -hmm. and I also think it should go back to killing you. <laughs> right? Well, I mean, <laughs> like, Jim, it what's causes it a name? Your, it okay. causes your heart to stop, you know, and then if you pass the save, you take some damage. <laughs> in, a, in a game where Cold Touch does uh, necrotic damage, right. should, should Phantasmal Killer really kill? I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I do. I do. Uh, you know, in the same um, way, like, finger, finger of Death should kill you, and Death spell. I was, anyway, uh, I like saver that's, die effects. It's all part obviously. of the 5th edition nerfing. And yeah, that's, it is. That's, it is. You know, it we've, is. we've talked about it. It is. Illusions are fun, right? Like, yeah. people play illusionists and illusion-using casters because they want that creativity. They want to to do weird things. Of course, the illusionist itself offers a lot of really cool opportunities to, to further enhance your illusions, but mm -hmm. I think just the spells themselves are fun and, and having a good understanding, the dungeon master having a good understanding of how his world works uh, and and how uh, targets interact with uh, with the illusions yeah. is going to help them adjudicate these edge cases where the players like all right all right hear me out I'm yeah. going to create this big thing yeah, yeah. and I and this is what I'd like players be sure to let the dungeon master know what effect you are going for when you're crafting yeah. your illusions and, and I think be be descriptive as possible because even something as simple as like the cantrip minor illusion right. You can get away with quite a bit if you're descriptive enough. I mean, you yeah. can come up with a Metal Gear box. Sure. I yeah. mean, you're like, I'm going to put a box over me. So they're running down here. I'm underneath <laughs> a wooden go. box. Create, and, yeah, creating cover with the one illusion yeah, cantrip well, that exists. That was, was going to be my follow-up <laughs> question. I was like, really, just one? 
The only illusion here is the illusion of balance between spell schools. <laughs> there is no illusion um, of balance. <laughs> Even that's a lie. <laughs> minor illusion, of course, for for a lot of uh, casters, minor illusion is very useful for creating cover. Of course, for an illusionist wizard, it, it does double duty with both uh, sight and sound and, and becomes a really potent uh, cantrip yeah. in that respect. But like even something like a, a high elf thief that has minor illusion as opposed to say mage hand or message or, or prestidigitation, which tend to be you know popular picks for those. Minor illusions there is like I, I can create cover like when do I, I mm -hmm. this will always be useful. It gets really fun with the illusionist ability to like make a part of your illusion real because then you've got minor illusion, doesn't require concentration, you just do it and make it real. I would let players do minor disguise self type effects with a minor illusion. Give themselves different distinguishing characteristics. Change the color of their hair. Mm -hmm. uh, change the sound of their voice temporarily. Like those are the kinds of things I might let a minor illusion do. Um, not a full on disguise self level, certainly not as long, but things like that. Give yourself a beard. Sure, give yourself a beard, uh, that kind of thing. Give yourself a girlfriend with a minor illusion. <laughs> This is my waifu. <laughs> right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. This is my, really just a, this a is body my pillow with 2D some... waifu. <laughs> I think that creating a, a, a cantrip that is an offensive illusion cantrip would be interesting. And I think this leaning into the blurriness between evocation and illusion is the mm -hmm. way to go here. Personally, for me, if it, if it was me, I would take Vicious Mockery and just completely reskin it. And it's it does in, psychic damage. Yeah, it does psychic damage, it imposes disadvantage, and maybe you have like a Dazzle Burst or something you'd be like Jubilee or Dazzler from the X-Men, and like it's a short range, you know, maybe it just does like uh, five feet somewhere around you. Like you just blast an, a, a, a blast of sound and light into, uh, you know, a creature's uh, face. And then they uh, do some psychic damage, disadvantage for their next attack, yeah. um, that kind of thing. Or maybe make it like Shocking Grasp and it's like a blast in their face and it sort of like temporarily blinds them. You can run away without them. Yeah, no reaction. Uh, no reaction to, uh, to get that attack of opportunity. So I, those are things I might add in terms of illusion cantrips, just to, mm -hmm. to fill things out and to give that illusionist uh, a little minor combat spell to, to get them out of a tight spot. Kind of to go back to like interacting with how, how illusions are interacted with by people. Yeah. Uh, what, one of the things it's, that's interesting is invisibility and how it, how it interacts with like being hidden from someone and right. like what that should mean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm and the way it is. A lot of particularly players want invisibility to be like full stealth mode. Yeah. You, that you can't see anything, you've got to detect the fumes from my exhaust port, kind of. <laughs> like an infrared camera and watching people fart? Or like, like maybe just have a dog that can smell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Get that, that keen senses, it's right. smell. First off, determining how your invisibility works is one of those things that can be fun to do. Does it create a being where uh, light does not bounce off of them? And therefore passes through them, nothing's reflected back to the, to the eyes of the perceivers, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, we then get into the problem of then there's no eyeballs on the invisible creature to, to be able to light, see. To be able to see. But so they magic must account for that in some way. You could do the kind of like predator cloak, yeah. sort of if, if they're perfectly still and or there's a lot of noise in the background, you might not see them. But if you can get them against, say, a pattern or something that you can easily see their outline, that represents, say, successfully succeeding on a perception check to spot an invisible creature. You still have the disadvantage to hit them. You still have the whatever. They're still invisible. You mm -hmm. can't target them with spells, things like that. But you might know where they are. But this is sort of the, the important thing. You're just unseen when you're invisible. Yeah. And that comes with a set of advantages for it. You have advantage to attack people, people have disadvantage to hit you. You cannot be targeted by certain by spells that require uh, you know the that they be able to see their target. Um, the question that I have, number one, what are the different ways in which you can spot an invisible character? Mm -hmm. Whether that's Pruitt's uh, tried and true trick of using a bag of flour for uh, for spotting invisible antiquing antique the, invisible the shit out of them <laughs> just throw flour everywhere um, you know do things that uh, stick 
to the invisible character? Are they a part of the invisibility spell? You know, if, the, if, if they're not, then maybe something like rain or fog or mm -hmm. flower or some particulate matter in the air that can be, that can be used to uh, sort of detect disruptions in it would be mm -hmm. detect an invisible creature. Something thrown on the ground mm -hmm. that, that you can see footprints on. So like it'd be difficult to be an invisible creature and say like the sand or something like that. Uh, Throw a bag of pennies at them. Sling all of your copper pieces in where you, well, where you it, think they it, are. it should be your, your pouch out front anyway in case people want to steal. Well, number one, right? right, you should have a bag of fake money on your belt that people can steal or that you can drop that mo that certain monsters might pick up. Right. Uh, you trick them. Yes. yes, and then right. also when you're fighting someone, they go invisible, you just fan that out Yeah. and you watch where the pennies hit and fall. Watch where the pennies hit and fall, right. Yeah. It's so like that, throwing money around. Right, so that's <laughs> that's sort of some things to consider when using invisibility specifically. Obviously, uh, greater invisibility. I have always perceived the two of them as invisibility is like the predator cloak. Yeah. Right, once once the, the illusion is broken by drawing attention to the caster, you know, in older editions, it was like just about anything. And like, I remember second edition of visibility kind of sucked because it was like, if you opened a door, you know, you would be in, you would be visible, right? It was not very, you, you really just had to walk around. You couldn't do anything else. You can breathe, but not too fast. Right. <laughs> as opposed to like old school D&D invisibility, which was like, as long as you don't cast a spell or attack, this will never end. Yeah. And you are invisible indefinitely. Very fun way to explore a dungeon. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I think you would start to go crazy if you were invisible for too long. <laughs> for too long. Like, sure. it's like a whole sensory the, deprivation. The and... most Mithras did was three days. <laughs> he spent three days invisible. Uh, include part of that, he, part of that, he was knocked out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, was, and he, he got just, knocked out invisible and nobody out found invisible. him. Nobody found him. It was, it was a lifesaver, really, because he got knocked out in the, just a random corridor of the dungeon. Poison gas trap. Uh, and um, uh, But like in 5th edition, you know, invisibility is what, like 10 minutes? It's not the, that particular uh, long of a spell. Mm -hmm. um, greater, I perceive greater invisibility as like the, like they've gone cloaked, right? We cannot see them, you know, and now you're having to listen for breathing you're having to listen for footsteps. The invisible character in both cases needs to make a stealth roll in order to be hidden. Mm -hmm. Hidden is the condition under which you cannot be perceived at all. Invisibility is just the point at which you cannot be seen. Um, and so like stealth character, you know, stealth based characters with invisibility, we, we have a house rule where we give them advantage on their stealth. Mm -hmm. um, you might not like, you know, Pro was saying, maybe it was a different show and I'm remembering actually of like sneaking around the forest and it's like, you might be unseen, but you're heard. Yeah. Same thing there. So as, as, as far as um, illusions go, we've mentioned like there, there's a couple of oddballs in here. Spells the dungeon master is going to want to think about. Like a good hard think. Phantom Steed. Okay, Phantom Steed. Why? First off, why is it not conjuring? Why is it not conjuring? Why is it not conjuring? That's my con that's my question. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You are literally conjuring a <laughs> Phantom Steed, which in the description it does say, you know, you can conjure phantom creatures. Sure. But when I think phantom in that way, I'm thinking like like phantasmal force. Uh -huh, like uh -huh. Something yeah. to scare you and hurt you. Like this is like, yeah, I'm gonna create like a real thing that's not really there. Um, right. Or you could reskin it to be like Ghost Steed, and it's like a necromancy spell that summons a, a, a spectral, mm -hmm. uh, a spectral mount. Um, that those are the two ways I would take it. Uh, Phantom Steed is is a lot like creation. Is a lot like sort of less so like Shadow Blade, in which you know, you're drawing something from another plane and creating something with it. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that sure sounds like conjuration. <laughs> 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 I mean, it does. I mean, I understand that shadow casting and shadow magic is connected with illusion in the lore of Dungeons and Dragons, but it's one of those things that the the, the inconsistency of the definition sort of gets to me. So I find Phantom Steed an oddball spell, even if I like it. Right? Like it's a it's a useful spell in some situations. If you need a long term mount, not a bad one uh, to have. I always, I just really like the mount spells and the phantom seed spells from earlier editions where it's like first level conjures you a mount that you can ride around on. Yeah, it's an oddball. Fear is another one, right? Fear is an illusion spell, mm -hmm. uh, which is like, why is this not enchantment? Enchantment, yeah. I mean, it seems like you're messing with their... Anyway, right. Yeah. It, it, unless what you're doing, unless what you're doing is like, you know, there are some illusion spells. Phantasmal Killer uh, imposes frightened uh, with one of its saves, one of its two saves, mm -hmm. and I would say that you could do get, you know, get similar effects from Phantasmal Force. But there, I might even let like a major image or something, you know, in a context appropriate impose fear. So I think fear is an oddball. Magic Mouth is an oddball as well. 
uh, magic mouth is like it delivers information so it's like you could conceivably see it as a divination type spell but at the same time it also alters the environment that it's in so is how is it not transmutation for one magic mouth is just a weird spell and i i well, usually use it just as a dm to yeah. taunt the players yeah it's just yeah yeah it's <laughs> like use it for <laughs> yeah the players are going in on the on the bad guy's lair but he knows they're coming so he leaves a magic mouth spell behind on a cardboard cut out of himself right like, oh, you thought you were going to find me to Day. Yeah. Not so. Not so. <laughs> Maybe yeah. next time. You, you, you use magic mouth to taunt the party without having to worry about them interrupting your dungeon or your villain's monologue. You know the best casting of that <laughs> ever I think is it was science fiction but in uh, Serenity. Mm, okay. <laughs> Guy killed yeah. me with a sword mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's basically magic mouth. Yeah. That's like, basically that's, magic that's, mouth. That's a well, way to use that. That's how I've, I've used it with Guy, in the first season of Saber Dice. There's yeah. a magic mouth of the of, of the dying caster. You know. Yeah. The, what's the last thing I can do to to alert my ally? So I'll just, they're going to find my body here. I will cast a magic mouth to deliver a message once they find my body. Of course, we have mentioned creation. Why creation is not conjuration, I have no idea. You are literally creating objects out of nothing. There's a class ability for the conjurer that lets them create small objects out of nothing. That's like, why is this spell? And again, it's because we're pulling on the shadowy substance of the shadow veil to create it. So it must be an illusion. Even though the shadow veil is, seems to be more necromancy focused than illusion focused. Yeah, it's just, we either embrace the inconsistencies in the spell schools or you go through every spell and rearrange them and put them into different schools. Whatever, however much work you want to do. <laughs> yeah, we're, 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 we're just here picking, uh, we're picking just them pick apart. apart. We're uh, picking Because that's the whole point of this. What are some, some awesome combos that you like? To, to use in the illusion school. I think my favorite use for an illusion spell is major image used to create an image of the party walking. And you put it at the, ex the extreme extent of the major image range, and you have the image be the party walks forward as long as the spell lasts. And you use it as a decoy. You use it to set off ambushes that your enemies might be preparing for you. You use it to not, it's not like a scout ahead, but you can trigger something. And again, this re requires the dungeon master to have an idea of how their NPCs react, how the monsters react. Would the enemies react to a major image, which is a third level spell? It, 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 it's not just sight, it's all these other categories that go along with it. Um, and if it comes from an illusionist themselves, eventually it can change as long as the illusion's there, right? Up, if you cast it at higher level spell slots, it's permanent. A major image is a very versatile spell, and one of the better third level spells to take beyond like the big ones, like you got, you got to have fireball. So major image is fun, and I, you knew that fireball is a good spell. Every wizard should have it. It's a fucking awesome spell, and you will, your illusions will be all the more potent if occasionally you drop a fireball on someone, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Well, if you fake it every now and again, and people are like, because that's when you're like, oh, he always does this. It's not real. Boom! <laughs> right. <laughs> Never doubt me ever. Right. The illusions are, be are work best when they are mixed with uh, other spells, so that the an illusion is about deception. So why would you always do the same thing? You should seek to trick your enemies to to weave subtle magics that will keep them on their toes. I really like Nistel's magic aura, uh, even though as an illusion spell, it kind of is. I can see where they're coming from with it. I can also see it being some other kind of magic, maybe abjuration. Mm -hmm. This is kind of protective in nature. Uh, I mean, you are you are deceiving uh, the intent of something. You yeah. are masking it. But it's like 30 days of casting, it makes it permanent until dispelled. And it's and so it's one of those where if my caster has it, then you got it, you're gonna bet they're casting it on every magic item that they have. Mm -hmm. that they are casting it on their spell books and their magic just, items. Just a their... dude. And then once they're done with that, it's like, I'm going to cast it on myself so that magic that I cast on myself will be masked. And then, of course, you can cast on yourself so that you register as a completely different being, right? So you don't set off, say, Glyphs of Warding. Uh, Nistel's Magic Aura and Glyphs of Warding are like one of the few areas where alignment comes into play in 5th edition. So mm -hmm. you can, like, mask your alignment with Nistel's Magic Aura. You can mask your creature type. Uh, there's a lot of fun things you can do with it. In terms of like other spells though, there's some powerful illusions. Mirage Arcana, mm -hmm. which creates, first of all, over, over a phenomenal, it's like a, it's, it's, an, it's a ridiculous area of effect. Lasts for 10 days, no concentration. And completely alter the features of the area of effect that it's in. Mm -hmm. And if you're an illusionist, you can then change it 
as as long as the spell lasts, you can sort of like use an action to sort of change the features of it. So Mirage Arcana is a spell where it's like, well shit, there's a mountain range in the way. I'm gonna cast this spell and now it is a flat featureless road and we're gonna walk around it. And we got 10 days to get through this area and that's, then it's gonna be fine. Or you do the opposite where it's like, man, we're really being, we're being pursued by enemies and we cannot, uh, you know, we can't shake them. I'm just gonna Mirage Arcana mountain range in their way. They're just gonna have to deal with it for mm -hmm. 10 days unless they can dispel it. And so it's things like that. When you think about Mirage Arcana in a cast in a dungeon, and the area of effect that, that Mirage Arcana covers, and then you start figuring out the square footage of your dungeon, you can see that like a single casting of this spell might be all, all that you need for the villain to completely throw off the party. A lich illusionist or something that their dungeon changes all the time in an attempt to confuse and stall the party. And then it's the party's job to kind of like find their way through this ever-shifting illusionary maze mm -hmm. as doors are thrown up that were not there before, that are there now, that lead to nowhere, or doors that were there are covered over in illusory walls that are, for all functional purposes, real. Um, it's a powerful spell that is, on the one hand, not very well thought out <laughs> in terms of its impact on your game world, but is the potential for shenanigans is high with, yeah. <laughs> with Mirage Arcana. Well, also because, it, I mean, if you throw in maybe some programmed illusions or right. some, you cast, up up, cast, up cast major, major images, images right. th to throw those in there to give right. it some depth. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you have multiple illusions going, but yeah. you can really start effing with some people. You can create a whole town that's just not there. That's just not the there. The town of Rockridge. It's, it's just, just not, not there. there. It's just not there. It's just an illusory <laughs> town. Yeah. And you start getting... I, these are the times where I'm like, I go back and watch like holodeck episodes on Next Gen. Oh my God, because yeah. Because the things that they get up to there are sort of like, that's illusionist fodder, right? Mm -hmm. Particularly at this level of illusion. You know, you, you combine this with, say, like, the keen mind feat, and your illusions are perfectly detailed. Say, with the keen mind feat, impose disadvantage on any investigation checks done to try to... Yeah. To try to discern whether these are illusions or not. They've surpassed the uncanny valley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they've, they've gone to the other side of it. James Cameron is an illusionist. Right. <laughs> Never thought yeah. of it that way. <laughs> Feature in The Witcher 3, one of the DLCs, where, the, where Geralt has to go into an illusory demi plane yeah. that was created for a princess. So it's filled with fairy tale characters and fairy tale logic mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. But it reminded me of the book, A Young Lady's Primer from Diamond Age. Uh, yeah, A Diamond Age or A Young Lady's <laughs> Illustrated Primer. A oh, Young Lady's Illustrated Primer, where yeah. it's sort of like a sentient, in this case, it's a science fiction sort of nanotech sort of thing, but you could convert that into D&D uh, &D and other fantasy RPGs by having it be like a sentient magic item that's meant to serve as a tutor and instructor and a governess for a child yeah. that eventually creates an illusory demiplane that they can inhabit and play in, mm -hmm. which then maybe, you know, it's a fun magic item in, in the DLC of The Witcher 3, you know, you're, you're there for other purposes, but it, it's a fun use of it and I've always wanted to include it since I've, since I've played through that.